At the end of the war, when the world found out the details of what went on in the concentration and extermination camps, they were shocked in many ways. They were shocked about the infamous phrase used by many of the war criminals on trial at Nuremberg, I was only following orders. They were even more shocked that many of those sadistic criminals were women. In the newsreels, there were scenes of the Aufseherin, German for female overseer. They were smiling and smirking. When some of them were interviewed, they seemed arrogant and almost proud of what they had done and been a part of. Whipping, beatings, torture, endless roll calls in freezing cold or searing heat, on-the-spot executions, and the infamous Selektion. All of these things are associated with the sadistic female guards of the Nazi concentration camps. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today's topic, the evil women of the Holocaust and the unspeakable things they did to their victims. Ilza Koch, as the months and years went on and the many trials of concentration camp staff proceeded, the world saw how evil and disturbed the SS women of the Holocaust were, but the most infamous and twisted of them all wasn't in the SS. Actually, she was just someone's wife, until she became the Queen of Buchenwald, or as most call her, the Beast of Buchenwald. Ilza Koch was also called the Witch of Buchenwald, but more often than not, the witch became the Bitch of Buchenwald. She was married to SS Commandant Karl Koch, who became commander of the Buchenwald camps in 1937 after receiving his training in camp administration and cruelty at the Sachsenhausen camp. Being the Commandant's wife immediately gave Ilsa a lot of power, which she used from the start for which inmate or even guard would go against the commander's wife. In an ordinary world, maybe, but not in a concentration camp world. Ilza loved power and money, or rather what money could buy. Eventually, she and her husband were convicted by an SS court for embezzling and fraud. Both were jailed, and a German firing squad executed Karl Koch in the last days of the war. Ilza survived 16 months in a German prison before being released before the war ended. One of the things she had bought with embezzled money was a large equestrian arena because she loved to ride. Several prisoners died or were killed during its construction. She also had the SS whip anyone she wanted. Maybe she didn't like the way they looked at her. Maybe she didn't like their looks. Could be anything. She would often taunt prisoners until one looked at her and then had them whipped. The thing that Ilza Koch became most famous for was her fascination with tattoos and tattooed men. One of the camp's doctors during Koch's rule was Eric Wagner, who did his PhD dissertation on tattooed men and criminality while at the camp. Part of his dissertation included the skins of prisoners killed, especially for him, and for Ilza as well. At least, that's what several inmates testified after the war. Lampshades and book covers of human skin were found at Buchenwald after the war, but no direct evidence was found linking Koch to them. Still, Koch was convicted of incitement to murder and many other charges, and sent to prison for life. She committed suicide in 1967. Irma Gresa Irma Gresa was an SS Offsetin at Ravensbrück, the women's camp about 50 miles north of Berlin. Ravensbrück was not only an all-women's camp, except for the commandant, his staff, and watchtower guards, most of the overseers were women. For those Americans watching, Ravensbrück was also the primary training place for the Offsetin. Irma Gresa and others we'll tell you about in this video received their degrees in brutality there. Gresa was 10 when Hitler came to power. She came from a broken home and was a high school dropout who ran away at 15 and worked at an SS hospital until she was 17. She was exposed to every kind of propaganda imaginable and fully bought in to what she was being told about enemies of the state and the Jews. She had wanted to join the League of German Girls at 15, but her father said no. So at 17, she rebelled even more and volunteered for the SS Offsetin at Ravensbrück. After her time at Ravensbrück, she was sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau. She went on a rampage. When people collapsed at the interminable roll calls taken in the camp, Gresa was known to stomp them in with her hobnailed boots. Like so many of the other camp guards, male or female, she took any sign of disrespect, whether real or just in her mind, seriously. She would often shoot them where they stood. As you can see from the video, Irma Gresa was a plain-looking housewife, almost like a character out of a Monty Python skit. She was sometimes referred to as the Beautiful Beast during and after the war and thought of herself in that way. She had a particular eye for beautiful women, not out of lust, but jealousy. 
She's recorded to have frequently singled out a beautiful woman prisoner and then whipped them, sometimes with an especially damaging plated or braided whip. Then according to the logic of Birkenau, she was useless to work and was sent off to the gas chamber. Greza also accompanied Dr. Mengele and others at the large Selections that took place when the crowded trains of victims pulled into the camps and had a hand in sending tens of thousands of people to death. In a British-regulated war crimes trial shortly after the war, she was found guilty of mass murder and executed by hanging at 22, the youngest woman ever sentenced to death under British law. She deserved it. Hermina Bronsteiner The case of Hermina Bronsteiner is an amazing one. First off, her full name at the time of her death in 1999 was Hermina Bronsteiner Ryan. That's right, Ryan. In 1964, she was discovered living in Queens, New York, a well-thought-of neighbor and a clean, friendly housewife. After the war, Bronsteiner was kept in various internment camps for suspected Nazis and war criminals until 1947. In 1949, police from her homeland of Austria had her sent back to face trial where she was convicted of crimes against human dignity and given three years in prison. She only did a few months, considering time served in Germany before her trial, and was out in early 1950. She had beat the more serious charges of crimes against humanity she committed at the Majdanek extermination camp for lack of witnesses. There were two reasons for that. First, Majdanek was a death camp. And second, any survivors in the years after the war were either lost in a sea of refugees in Europe didn't know about the trial, or wanted to put the experience as far behind them as possible. In 1958, she married an American tourist named Russell Ryan, emigrated to Canada with him, then moved to the U.S. in 1959. She became an American citizen in 1963. Through a series of coincidental events, Simon Wiesenthal, the Holocaust survivor turned Nazi hunter, met some Maidanek survivors in Israel. They supplied him with information they had researched and he contacted the New York Times when a young Jewish American reporter knocked on Bronsteiner's door in Queens. She realized immediately that the reporter knew who she was and it all came spilling out, except the gory details. Her husband tried to defend her by saying, my wife wouldn't hurt a fly because he thought she had worked in the infirmary of Majdanek and Ravensbrück. Wrong. It took five years for the US to strip Bronsteiner of her citizenship. It was an exceedingly long process, but the quiet housewife from Queens, known as the Stomping Mayor for her penchant for stomping inmates into the ground, was found guilty of mass murder and crimes against humanity. She was found guilty of whipping two women to death. She was sentenced to life in 1981 and was released for health reasons in 1996. She died three years later in Bochum, Germany. Hertha Oberhoitzer Another miscarriage of justice occurred in the case of Hertha Oberhoitzer, a defendant at the famous doctor's trial of SS medical personnel that took place at Nuremberg in 1946-47. Oberhoitzer was another veteran of Ravensbrück, but as you might have guessed, she was a doctor assigned to be an assistant to the chief surgeon of the SS and the SS chief Heinrich Himmler's personal physician, Karl Gebhardt. There was only one reason for Oberhoitzer and Gebhardt to be at Ravensbrück and it had nothing to do with making people healthy. They were there to perform medical experiments on people who were guinea pigs for whatever bizarre and painful procedure the two could dream up, or with the help of information from the other SS doctors in other camps who were carrying out monstrous experiments of their own. You see, if you think of people as less than human, it's easier to treat them that way, and reinforcing that idea is their appearance and condition, regardless of the cause, which was Nazi mistreatment. Oberhoitzer took part in gruesome experiments, some of which were common among the sadists of the SS medical corps, rubbing various acidic and infectious compounds into already infected wounds to measure the rate of healing or the spread of infection, reaping and transplanting healthy organs or harvesting organs from the freshly dead to put in other prisoners, etc. Bone transplants were done with no anesthetic. What's more, Oberhoitzer seemed to enjoy tormenting her patients. When women cried out for water, she gave them some, mixing it with vinegar. Oberhoitzer was the only woman at the doctor's trial and was sentenced to 20 years. In 1951, her sentence was commuted during protests against death sentences and long prison terms for many Nazis in Germany. Worse, she only did a year of that sentence before being released for good behavior. 
Stunningly, Hertha Oberhoitzer became a doctor again when she was released from prison. No one is exactly sure how that happened. Perhaps at a time when many records were lost, no one thought to check court records. Maybe a former Nazi official rubber-stamped her license. She was a family doctor near Kiel on the North Sea coast for six years before she lost her license for good. She died in 1978 in a retirement home. Maria Mandel Maria Mandel was born in Austria, like a surprisingly large percentage of Nazi war criminals. When Germany and Austria unified in the Anschluss Union of 1938, she moved to Munich and joined the SS Aufsehren at one of the first concentration camps, Lichtenberg, in Saxony. Most of the prisoners at Lichtenberg were men. Mandel got a crash course in how Nazis handled enemies of the state from the latest in a long line of commandants that had begun in 1934 with one of the most infamous Nazi commandants, Theodor Eicher, who is credited with establishing the cruel and sadistic regimen of all the concentration camps when he was the first commandant of the first camp, Dachau. She soon graduated from Lichtenberg and was sent to Ravensbrück, where she was swiftly promoted after joining the Nazi party. Mandel had the rank of Oberofserin, and she was the woman who handed out assignments to the others and assigned her comrades to punish certain inmates or barracks or inflict them herself. She did her job so well that in October 1942 she was promoted and put in charge of all Ofsherin at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Mandel oversaw the activities of Irma Gresa and a host of others at the extermination camp and promoted Gresa to head the Hungarian women's section in 1944. Many people don't know this, but most of the killings at Auschwitz occurred in about two years, from the spring of 1942 to the summer of 1944. Mandel was there for much of it, and her signature was required on the list of inmates that were brought to the gas chambers after being worked nearly to death. She was culpable in the deaths of over 500,000 people. Many of the women chosen for death were picked by Mandel personally. She added even more banal horror to life in the women's section at Birkenau. She had a band formed for inmates. They played during the infamous roll calls, hangings, shootings, and selections, all to theoretically lull the victims into a false sense of security. Everyone knew, though, when the band played, something terrible would happen. After the killings at Auschwitz began to slow, Mandel was sent to Dachau and fled into the mountains of Bavaria when the Americans liberated the camp. She was eventually captured by the Americans and put on trial in 1947 in Poland, the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau. She was convicted of crimes against humanity and hanged on January 24, 1948. This is History on Fleek. See you next time.